Hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Soccer Queens podcast. I have Emily Neff back on as a repeat guest. And Emily is also a coach to youth female athletes. She has a female athlete only facility in Pennsylvania, and she's just doing incredible work. And she has coached for several years. How many years has it been, Emily? In Relentless, seven. Outside of that, almost 15. Oh, wow. So guys, we got so much experience and wisdom today, and we are going to just get right to today's topic and dive further into ACL injuries. So the last time Emily was on, we talked about the importance of year round strength training and how muscular weakness is a big factor in ACL risk. But one of the other things that isn't talked about a lot is too much load and how ACL injuries are actually overuse injuries. And Emily, when you brought that up to me, when we were messaging back and forth, I was like, wow, that makes so much sense. So let's go into why ACL injuries are really overuse injuries. No, I I love this conversation because it's something that we don't do a good job in the media of having, you know, our athletes and parents and coaches understand because since the early nineties, we've been so focused on, well, what makes boys and girls different because girls are tearing their ACLs more. So we focused on those biological differences. We focus on, well, it must be anatomy or maybe it, it must be hormones, right? That must be why these tears keep happening or girls are hitting valgus more. It's gotta be the valgus. But when you look into the research, in fact, we find that at the incidence of injury, both males and females have exactly the same mechanics. So we can't claim that girls move differently because even though in some movement patterns, we see it at the point of injury, they don't, it's exactly the same. So biomechanics, we got to rule that out. When it comes to anatomy, there's no significant difference between a female Um, between all female athletes in regards to, well, all female athletes are all smaller. Instead, we see that there's a large variance, but that rate of injury is still very high. So we can't use such an umbrella term such as anatomy is the reason we have wider hips because significantly all girls don't have wider hips. Um, Some men will have wider hips. Some girls will have wider hips. Some girls will have more narrower hips. The spectrum is too large for us to have such a specific that that this is a causal relationship. So we have to rule anatomy out knowing that also with the anatomy, there is a lot of original debate on notch sizes. Well, girls have smaller notch sizes. Well, comparatively, yes, we do have smaller notch sizes because comparatively we have smaller bodies uh, because girls reach that reach that puberty or peak height velocity earlier before boys. And that's why we don't have the same structure. We don't, we don't grow as, as tall. We don't have the same, um, anatomical structure because of this difference of puberty, but the size of our notches don't correlate to an increased occurrence of ACL tear. So we don't have the data that's telling us, oh, that's why. So we have to rule that out. And then finally with that hormones, there has been so much debate over hormones, which is very interesting because most of the research actually shows there's very little relationship between especially hormones and estrogen and ligament laxity. In fact, there's a, there's a very recent article in 2022, uh, I can send it to you, I forget the author's name, but what they looked at is they looked at the different concentrations of estrogen over the course of an athlete's menstrual cycle. And we compared that from athletes and non-athletes, and then athletes that were classified as eumenorrheic, meaning they had regular menstrual cycles compared to those that were oligomeric, meaning that they just have irregular menstrual cycles. They weren't missing, but they probably had less than 12 cycles total a year. And when we looked at that, we saw there was no significant relationship between ligament laxity and estrogen concentration changes. In fact, we saw that estrogen changed over the course of the menstrual cycle because it does, but laxity stayed the same. 
the only significant difference that we found is that athletes that were had that irregular cycle on average throughout the menstrual cycle had higher um had stiffer ligaments compared to the non-athlete counterparts as well as compared to the regular menstrual cycle counterparts but with that we can't really make any conclusions because that's really the only article that we have right now to demonstrate that and there were some weaknesses in that literature and that at the time of the research the girls with irregular menstrual cycles had regular menstrual cycles so instead they had a history of irregular menstrual cycles so it doesn't seem like we can create this direct relationship. So instead, when we understand the physiology of tissue breakdown, we have to remember that our, our ligaments are responsive to load. And that load can be protective in that it helps build stiffness or joint stability. And it also can be degradative in that it's breaking us down in that the load that we're exposed to leads to an overall breakdown of tissue because it's not met with enough recovery. Loading is great, but loading won't lead to more stiffness if we don't actually recover. So uh, we have research from the early 90s that actually looked at weightlifters' knees and we looked at their ligament stiffness and we compare that to an average athlete that doesn't really participate in frequent resistance training. And when we looked at it, we found that the athletes that were weightlifters had significantly thicker ligaments. So that tells us ligaments are responsive or responsive to loading. So if we don't have that direct correlation between anatomy, between hormones, but we are seeing a relationship between ligament uh, stiffness and loading parameters, we have to understand that that means that there's a relationship between the amount of load and the amount of recovery and how our ligaments are actually going to be structured. So how we define an overuse injury within the sports science world is that we have too much breakdown and not enough recovery leading to overall, whether it be the complete rupture, a partial rupture, any type of over use injury just means too much work, not enough. Uh, it's a very simple relationship. Your body is so adaptive as long as the stimulus we provide is progressive and large underline here, it's met with recovery. So ACL injuries are defined within sport literature as overuse injuries because they they fall underneath that umbrella term of too much work, not met with enough recovery leading to breakdown. And the reason um, that we now believe that female athletes are experiencing ACL injuries as such a greater occurrence because in comparison to males, um, there's actually an article, it's a really interesting article, it's called anterior cruciate ligament injury toward a gender environmental approach. And what they did is they reviewed overarching literature and we looked at females versus males and the occurrence of tears, changing in biomechanics. And we found that our biomechanics were very similar and the rate of tears were very similar as long as our training loads were similar. Mm. So that brings the conversation that we have this issue in, in research where we are confusing the terms of sex and gender, because sex is physiological, gender is a very complex term. Gender is, affects how we go about treating our athletes. And to this day, we have a very small percentage of female athletes that are required to strength train. And on top of that, we have an overarching amount of literature showing that the amount of frequency of youth sport has risen exponentially within the past decade. So we're seeing more girls than ever actually tearing their ACLs within the past 20 years, despite all of this research that we've been doing on our sex differences, because we fail to look at our gender differences. We fail to look at the fact that girls are being asked to play more and more sport, but they're not being provided the tools to strengthen their body as well as the time to allow for recovery and adaptation. 
And we're seeing an exponential increase within these tears, especially at the adolescent, at the adolescent age group. So that's what makes our ACL injuries so interesting because they're overuse and we know how we can reduce the chance of an overuse injury. Unfortunately, these tools and the environment we're placing these young female athletes in isn't conducive to overall longevity and health. As you were talking there, I was just thinking about the past decade and how the injuries are rising at an alarming rate. But what we've changed in the past decade has been getting more girls in the gym, although we're not quite where we want to be with that yet. So it's good that that side of it's taken care of. But in the past decade, also girls are required to play more and more games and there's hardly any break from the year round grind. So that Mm. just makes the overuse argument for ACLs even more convincing because that's what's changed in the past decade. When you and I were growing up, Emily, we had a full summer off. We had a three month off season. Soccer was in, in the fall or just the spring. We could dabble in other activities. We could do leisure. We can get that recovery so that we're not overusing and risking ACL from all the loading. It's just like crazy to just see that trend in the past 10 years. Mm -hmm. And it is good to have year round strength and athletes who do that do have the best chance of reducing ACL. And I've seen that in my work. You've seen that with the girls that you've worked with, but that overtraining aspect is very serious. And I I want people to really think about this conversation we're having because a lot of girls don't even have a month off, even two Mm -hmm. weeks off. And if we're talking even just soccer, we look at the ECNL and all their showcases are in the summer or in the winter. And that's when you should be having an off season to strength train. And I am trying to wrestle with what the solution is, but it just seems to be getting worse as Mm -hmm. the years go on. So (laughs) what do you think the solutions are? (laughs) So I'm a big knowledge is power type of person. So I think what happens is that we have a lot of parents that need to understand the actual science behind this, because we're talking to parents that were brought up in a generation that were taught your athletes need to play multiple sports. Cause if you play multiple sports, you're going to have a decreased risk of injury because you're learning different movement patterns. That's hundred percent accurate. Unfortunately, if you actually look at that research, the multiple sport athletes play different sports at different seasons not within the same season. Those athletes weren't playing, you know, high school uh, soccer and then also club lacrosse at the same time. They played them at different seasons. So the argument that my athlete needs to play multiple sports is null when those sports seasons overlap. We can't be exposing these girls to all of this loading on the field without any time for recovery. It just, from a, from a logical standpoint, it just doesn't make sense. You made, um, a point in, in, um, previously on social media that I thought was really interesting. It was just kind of like FOMO is real. Obviously, you know, we hit these girls, they, they, their friends are doing it. That friend is really good. And if she's doing, I need to do it, but we can't let our athletes decide what's best for them. That's why we have parents. That's why we have coaches that are here to say, Hey, hon, I'm so glad that you are loving soccer right now. You mentioned that you want to try softball. I'd love for you to try softball. Softball is during the spring. So we have to make a decision. Are we going to play softball in the spring? Or are we going to play club soccer? We have to pick one. You can't tell your athlete. Yes, you can have it all because one, we're not preparing her for life. We're You can't have your cake and eat it too. You have to pick and choose. You have to prioritize. Two, we have to teach our athletes how to value and prioritize their health. And they can't be burning the candle at both ends. And that's exactly what we're doing. If we have these girls play their sport and a different sport within the same season, it just doesn't lead to long-term success. They might be happy in the short term because that's their social life, but 
our job is to help our, our, our athletes and our children understand that sport is one avenue that you can have a social life. There's so many other avenues for a social life, and we have to make sure we're prioritizing your long-term health. We're doing everything we can to keep you the strongest athlete we can be to build habits that we instill now and last a lifetime because for females, we will always have a, a greater risk of injury, especially post-menopause when we all are, will get osteoarthritis. It's going to happen. It's just how our bodies work, but we can push that off as long as we build really strong bones and muscles now and maintain that. So when it comes to what do you want for your athlete? Do you want your athlete to be super happy now, but in the long term, it might actually be disastrous to her? Or do I want to teach her how to be responsible for her body and her health and her time and lead her to making the best decisions that are going to impact her for a lifetime? That's such a good point. And I'm, I'm glad you shared the, the research with playing multiple sports. And a lot of those studies were done in completely separate seasons. And that doesn't happen a lot nowadays. It's, you know, field hockey, volleyball, soccer in the fall season, or mm -hmm. basketball with futsal or indoor soccer, which is a complete disaster <laughs> for, for overloading. But have mm -hmm. you found that a, a lot of your athletes are still like doing that model? They're doing multiple sports in a season. What have they experienced? Because it's, it's good for us to like, look at the science, but also I argue that what you and I do on a daily basis is like our own laboratory experiment, mm -hmm. because realistically, there's not a lot of studies anyway on female athletes, especially the youth that you and I train. And mm -hmm. we come across hundreds of girls on a yearly basis. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's a study in itself. So what have you experienced with the athletes you've worked with or just with athletes in your community? Mm -hmm. So ironically enough, we have found the athletes that actually commit to a sport have a less incident, a smaller incidence of injury year overall compared to our athletes that play multiple sports. But we feel that it's primarily because when they commit to one sport, they have actual off seasons. Mm -hmm. They have seasons where it's, and it's easier for them to focus of, Hey, I play softball year round. Yes, you do play softball year round, but when is your competitive season? Because if you have more than two competitive seasons, you're not going to be the best athlete because you need to match your competitive seasons with your preparatory seasons. When we always sit down with the parents and we have them pick, what are your two seasons to shine? What are your two seasons where you're going to prioritize coming in, in training three times a week? And if that means you're missing a practice, it means you're missing a practice. Um, if you have a good coach, they'll understand because you're not, hey, coach, I'm missing a practice because I want to watch TV today. Saying, hey, coach, I know that I need to do this type of training and I hope it's okay, but I'm just not going to be able to make it to this practice. And if you have a coach that punishes you, why do we want that type of coach? If you had a boss and your boss said, hey, I know your mom just died, but you need to go to work today. You would say, this probably isn't the healthiest environment for me. We can't as, as adults expect our, we can't as adults make these decisions of like, hey, I don't think I should work here because that's not really healthy. It's not really a good environment. If we're not teaching our kids that as as children, that's the point of sport. The point of sport is to have them learn these life lessons that they can apply to adulthood, especially for girls, because there's not many professional sports out there that we can have and excel um, and make a career out of it. It's just unfortunate, but that's the world that we live in. So having them understand, like having those conversations with your coaches is key. And it's paramount to understanding these coaches are the, are the leaders of your kid. They're teaching your kids lessons. If you don't agree with their methodology, maybe they're not the right coach for you. Maybe they're not the right coach for your athlete because they have a different priority in mind. And as a parent, your job is to create the priority for your athlete and teach her how to adhere to it. So would you recommend for athletes who are either single sport or playing multiple sports that each season they reserve for one thing. And then maybe in the summertime, they take that time to have a summer. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Is that what you usually recommend like two to three months off or what, what do you usually guide people? Yeah. The recommendations normally are going to vary depending on when they reach puberty. So pre-puberty, I always mention your athlete is just like, she's actually exactly from a physiological adaptation level, the same as a male. And we really can't get too strong and we really can't get too fast and we really can't jump too high because we're growing and our body is focusing on those important things. So let's have fun. Let's figure out what it is that we like. Let's try a new sport every season. Um, summer, we're going to take it off. If you really want to try that, that soccer camp, oh my God, go for it. Have so much fun. Maybe that week you don't go to training because that's going to be a lot for your kid. And she can miss one week of training. That's going to be okay. We don't want to burn the candle at both ends. As we start to reach that puberty age, about two years after, that's when we like to tell our athletes, it's kind of time to pick. What's the sport that you're really loving? Because at that age, that's when we start to see that exponential rise of hours being required where they're like, they're here. We have like some coaches called boot camp where it's like Sundays, you have five hours of your sport. Why? Why? Uh, we have softball pitchers. I just talked to a softball pitcher that was in one of those and had you pitch for three hours straight. The batters got a break. The catchers got a break. The pitchers did it. Baseball has pitching counts, but not in softball. So we have to really prioritize what are we going to do to help make sure this athlete stays strong. At that point, when she's about a sophomore or junior in high school, playing all of these different sports with like high school and club within the same season is too much. You have to decide. Maybe you're like, listen, I love lacrosse and I also love field hockey and I can't decide between the two. Okay. Normally we say, well, which one do you play club for? Because that normally means the one that you you like the most. So I played for club lacrosse. Okay, cool. Come fall, you're only going to play field hockey. But when we approach this field hockey, it has to be fun. It has to be fun. And if you're feeling stressed or worn out or just like unhappy, we need to reevaluate. We need to reevaluate why we're playing. And when you're playing that field hockey, you're not allowed to play lacrosse. Don't play it. If your club is going to tell you that they're not going to play you, they're lying because clubs are a profit driven business. They just want your money. They're not there for your, the health of your athlete. When you're playing school, they're not getting much money from you playing. (laughs) So play your school, have fun, skip club. Come winter, let's say again, so you're, you're lacrosse. You might have a couple showcases during, during winter where you have to travel to. Okay. How important are these showcases for you? Do you have to go? All right. If you have to go, we get it because sometimes that's how teams will be like, you're off the team then because they need, this is how this industry works. All right. But again, your winter will be fun because you're not allowed to do anything else besides, you know, training and that you have to limit it to two days a week for lacrosse, no more than two days a week, because we have to get you prepared for the spring season. And when spring and summer hit, that's when we know it's time to shine and you're going to go all in because you have your school season in the spring and in the summer, that's when it's like really important to go to all those showcases. Cause if you want to commit, that's how you're going to get seen. You don't really get seen, especially in our area from high school, unless you play for a really good high school, not that big in this area. Um, so, okay. Those are the times that you're going to be playing three to five days a week. Okay, but that's okay because you've allowed your body time to prepare for those two months, for those two seasons, because the two seasons prior, you made sure that mentally you did something that was fun and wasn't stressful. From a physical standpoint, you limited the amount of hours that you were allowed to push yourself to that extreme. And where that also was beneficial, because if you played sport five days a week, year round, that athlete is going to be burnt out, burnt out. There's no fun. What's the point? If you really want your kid to make a scholarship, you'll save money by not playing club, not doing any of it. And you'll be able to afford college. Like you will save money. Plus getting injured is really expensive. It's really expensive in the long run. So if it's a monetary reason that you want your kid to excel in sport, I like urge you to do the math and figure out how much money will she actually get How much money do I need to invest in travel? Because we have to fly places. We have to stay at hotels. We have to pay this club tuition. 
is it going to be a good investment? If not, say no to things. It's good to learn how to say no at a young age. So when you get older, it's so easy to don't feel guilt. Wow. That was amazing, Emily. And that's such a good point with the the money thing. It's like, look, if you actually break down the math of what you're spending on year round travel, starting at age eight with your daughter, is it really going to like be a good investment in the end? Or are you better off just playing for fun recreationally for free or, you know, running in the backyard with your girl for free Mm -hmm. (laughs) and then waiting Mm -hmm. until she hits puberty. And then it's like, okay, time to get serious and time to focus on one thing. And parents Mm -hmm. listening, please, please take this seriously because injuries are a big financial cost. They're also a big emotional cost. And for the athletes who are putting their identity in one sport since age eight, if that injury does happen, they're going to have nothing to fall back on because their identity is in that one thing. So there has to be other things going on in their life for their emotional well-being. And I just have seen a lot in, in my career, those, those girls who are just focusing on one sport pre puberty are the ones who tend to have adult problems as coach Mike Boyle says, and we're talking hamstring quad pulls, hip issues that should not be happening, groin tears and tweaks. It's like, what is going on? If those are happening to your young girl, elementary, middle school, it's time to reevaluate. That's, that's like an 80 year old person problem. And it, you know, Mm -hmm. strength training will help alleviate those, but if it's too much load, it's still really tough to avoid that. Would you say Emily? Thousand percent. Um, I always kind of like to write down our training loads. We, we just use a quantitative hours, like how many hours per week do you devote to sport? And that's going to be our measurement. Uh, cause it's hard if we did, you know, GPS, every kid is different. It, this is an easy way to focus on it. So what we do is we, we look at the hours and let's say, no, you're doing five to 10 hours. All right, cool. So like you're doing five to 10, you could probably like work out about three times a week, but let's think of that ratio. You have three hours to 10 hours. Um, that's not even half of your, do not even spending half the time preparing to what you are competing. So we have to put that into, we have to think about that because even if you did 10 hours and no lifting or no strength training, Definitely. The risk is huge. The three is a good buffer. It's a good buffer, but the risk is still there. So if we're playing year round and five to 10 hours is the smallest training load your athlete experiences and the rest of the seasons are like 20 plus. How are you going to prepare your athlete for the 20 plus? You can't, you literally can't without a season of chill. Let's go to the zero to five hours And let's train a little bit more to get your body to be more prepared for those huge demands. But if the demands remain so high, you're doing 20 plus hours every week for all four seasons. You, you literally can't fit in enough preparation time to prepare your body for that leading to just breakdown. Does that mean don't, don't train to prepare your body? Don't lift? Of course not. Right. We need to have that buffer. But I urge parents to consider what's the payoff if I just take a season in summer and I say, hey, no, we're only going to do that one camp and you're going to train consistently and we're going to go on a couple family vacations and we're going to read some books and we're going to have fun. And that gives the body enough preparation time and recovery time to prepare for all those other seasons that you're asking so much of it. It is interesting because parents think, well, my girl can do as much soccer as she wants or as much field hockey or softball pitching as she wants because she's strength training. And it's like, look like, yes, 
two to three times a week of strength training is really good for her. But like you said, it's, it's only going to stack the odds in your favor. It's still a risk to be doing that against 10 to 15 hours of sport a week. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it's just, there needs to be that balance between that preparation and then the sport specific load. And that's just, that's so key. And again, it's like when we were growing up, we didn't have to worry about that. You know, it, I, I didn't even know Emily, what an ACL tear was until I was like 16 years old. There were not my 10 year old teammates and peers getting ACL tears like you see now. And when, when you look at the pediatric research, it's just so much more in that middle school group in 2022. And yeah, it's just, so I, I never knew what it was. Like we just focused on good preparation, having leisure, playing our sport each season. And that was that. And now everyone's doing the opposite of that, but how's that working out for us? Have things gotten better? Have they? No, they haven't. Nope. They've gotten exponentially worse. <laughs> exactly. I think even what you say too, with the, this age group, how we're experiencing these tears so young. Not only that, we're seeing an increased retear. Like yes. growing up, it was rare if I heard a girl t- tear her ACL. Yeah. It'd be even rarer if I heard that she tore it or retore it. Yeah. Now that that I guarantee if you talk to an athlete that tore her ACL, she knows someone else that already tore it twice. Yeah. We're Is it a, if you've torn it once, it's a 20 to 30 percent greater risk of a second tear. Is that the number? Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, that's a whole other conversation of what we're not doing great in physical therapy. Um, (laughs) like I kind of always have stressed that argument of, well, if PT was that great and that's all you needed, you wouldn't have such a large percent chance of re-tearing it. It's not enough. Also, not P- not all PTs are alike. There's some that are great. There's others that haven't read research since the 90s, and they're still doing body weight training for an ACL injury. And we know that's not enough load. We know that we have to get our athletes back. I think a big issue is that there's this belief that PT is supposed to return you to where you were before the injury. And mm-hmm. I always try to urge, well, that's a problem because that's where we got injured in the first place. We need to surpass the level we were prior to injury to make sure that that injury doesn't happen again. But if we're in the cycle of let's return to where we were, of course, you have a greater chance of getting retorn. You haven't focused on the problem at hand. All you focused on was getting back to where you were. You didn't focus on why it happened in the first place. And it happened in the first place because your body was under, under prepared and under recovered. Mm -hmm. Let, let's talk about um, ACL tears that that you and I have experienced in our own athletes. So we were texting last week, and I think we both said we've each had one ACL tear um, in our several years of coaching. And um, I'll just say mine first. So it's it was a girl who it, it was year round. She never really had a break. She was doing yeah. strength training, but it was year round sport. Yeah. It was single sport before puberty and just constantly doing soccer over and over and over again, high school, seven V seven league in the summer, then high school jump right into high school preseason. And both injuries happened in high school season (laughs) and it was a retear too. So it's like, what was going on in the rehab process and was she ready for that high school season? But it also was kind of an outlier because it was a contact injury and she Mm -hmm. got tackled from behind and like totally like flipped over. So it was huge Mm -hmm. amount of force, but it's still like, dang, like she definitely was tired because high school season is two, three games a week. So that doesn't help either. Um, but yeah, it's just been interesting to, to see that. And I just, I, I hate when athletes go through this, it's just like, well, what could I have done better? What could have all of us done better? And it's just, well, sometimes it's the overuse that we're, that we're talking about and Mm -hmm. it's serious guys. Um, how about yours, Emily? Yeah. So when we were chatting, I, goodness, I'm trying to remember how many years ago, the only athlete I had that was here 
that um, tore her ACL. Like she was a part of our facility once she tore. Most of our other AC girl ACL girls join like post Terry, yeah. and then they come <laughs> in because they found out about us, uh, which is great. That's what we mm-hmm. love because I want to get them stronger than they were before. But this athlete was also a multi sport athlete. She, this was her first year of strength training. I think she was a junior in high school. Um, she was playing soccer and lacrosse. She was already committed to play D1 lacrosse. And she had a, one very stressful life. Her, both her parents were traveling all of the time. So I know that she was home alone a lot, wasn't fueling herself properly, wasn't getting enough sleep. Adding to that, she played lacrosse year round in her club, played school soccer play school lacrosse right after the soccer season she got really busy with club lacrosse over the winter I hadn't seen her for about two months I just remember getting in a text where she's like oh my god texting me I tore my ACL she was uh, of course just a mess because she was she you know in her mind this could mean that she was going to lose her scholarship something was going to happen um fortunately for her I think it was a kind of blessing in disguise because we had to spend her junior year just rehabbing. We spent the entire summer rehabbing, getting her stronger than she ever has been before. She played soccer for her senior year, but because she just, she was just cleared, her coaches were very willing to work with me in a very graded return to play. Mm -hmm. And that we didn't jump in and play preseason and do the mile test and all of this we picked and choose what was best. They wanted to do an hour warm up uh, and a mile run warm up every day. And I was just not okay with that for her, that she's, that's not, she's not there yet. That's fine. Like it was past the way of why are we warming up for every day running a mile? But anyhow, um, I was like, listen, that's your, that's how you run your practice. That that's you. I really, this athlete is not prepared for that yet. I want her to play we limited her minutes. She was only allowed to play like the really important games for the entire game. All of that was limited when we, and she didn't play the club or cross. She was only allowed to pick up a stick and do like light skill work, but she was not allowed to do any type of competitive, whether even be a scrimmage, not allowed, Mm -hmm. just doing skill work. Winter hit, soccer was done forever. Thank goodness. That's when we started doing small, small sided games then got her into the bigger actual games within the winter season for lacrosse. Then she played her entire season, no issues. She continued to strength train with us two times a week throughout has never had an issue since. So she was like my, I'm so sorry that happened, but I was also kind of glad because it was kind of like a good wake up call of like Mm -hmm. burning the candle at both ends. We have to focus on you. We have to put your health first. And I was fortunate enough that her coaches were very receptive to me and receptive to the information I was giving them versus I've had some coaches that are just like, you know, they blow you off and you're like, Mm -hmm. okay, well, like, I really like, we're on the same team here. We want your team to win and we want this athlete to be successful. We don't want her injured again. So I think that was like a perfect storm for an injury, but also turned out well because her coaches were so receptive. Um, But, you know. I've seen athletes in the past now that have come to us like post ACL. I had one athlete come to me post second ACL tear. Mm-hmm. She tore her one leg sliding in, in softball. A year later, she returns to the game and didn't she tear her other ACL sliding mm-hmm. into home the same way? Like my heart wow. broke for her. Like how psychologically, how much does that just like impact you? So starting with work, we found, she found out about us. That was right after her second tear post, um, like, I think she was about seven months, months post stop. And I just remember my eyes were open for how not great her rehab was because she didn't even have range of motion in her first tear that knee, that range of motion wasn't even there. And I just remember being like, we have so much work to do. Um, but that for me was such an eye opener of like, not only did you tear one ACL, you tore the other because did your physical, did no one tell you 
this is something we have to focus on for the rest of your life. Like we have to focus on keeping you strong and resilient just because you're cleared to play doesn't mean that we can forget that you had that injury. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that just as a, as an entire, um, like industry, whether it be a physical therapist, a coach, all of us need to do a better job at educating our parents and athletes at, we can't burn the candle at both ends. We have to figure out what we're going to prioritize and stick to it and making sure that we communicate those priorities with our coaches, whether they be schools or clubs and maintain your strength and physical health year round, because that's like, that's in my opinion, the first layer, that's the first Mm -hmm. layer, because that's what we know can help reduce the chance of an injury from there. Let's manage training loads. Let's manage our mental health with that. Because if we're not managing how your athlete is understanding how to like manage her stress levels, she's at a high chance of injury and we're doing a disservice to them. I'm just thinking about some more examples. So with the lacrosse girl, you had the softball girl, it it seems like everyone's just kind of blasting right into the season and going from one season to the next. And I see that a lot in the soccer world too. And people who have reached out to me about ACL or meniscus tears, and they go from high school season to three games a week from August to November. And then Mm -hmm they might have like a week for Thanksgiving or like four days and then it's showcase time in December. So they're Mm -hmm. really Mm -hmm. plowing through that high school season, right into ECNL, right into futsal, then right into spring, which is the main season for soccer. And then summer Mm -hmm. there's ECNL nationals and regionals. So they're literally Mm -hmm. just plowing through the whole year and Mm -hmm a lot of people are like, well, when do I take off? When do I, I can't miss that showcase. And to your point earlier, it's like, if you're seventh, eighth grade, you don't really need to go to a showcase because no. college coaches aren't watching you. They They're definitely no. not, not watching that Sunday game when everyone's tired after two games on Saturday, <laughs> like mm-hmm. it's a total disaster. Mm-hmm. And I also think that these organizations like ECNL and the girls Academy, need to be mindful of the high school seasons and when they're placing these showcases, it's really concerning as well from, from the top. Oh, it's so concerning because even with that, we have our ECNL girls playing, like their Sundays are reserved for that club when they're in soccer season in the fall, where it's like Sunday would, would have been your day off and they don't even get a day off because they're playing Monday through Saturday in high school. There's an optional practice during the week for ECNL and a mandatory practice or game on Sunday where it's like, what did, what did we gain here? What did we gain here? Maybe have a league for the girls that aren't playing high school, but in our area specifically, it's highly recommended that they don't not play high school because it's frowned upon um, in college, which I get. So then why play on Sunday? Why not just like let them have a day off and then pick things back up in the winter? And it just doesn't, besides it just being profit driven, I just don't understand what the goal is. What's the goal of having them play so many days throughout the week? I just, it doesn't, where else in life do you do that? You don't work seven days a week and find that you're going to be more successful. You might be successful for two weeks and then you burn out. Mm -hmm. Uh, Why are we teaching our athletes at such a young age that this is what you have to do to succeed? Because it doesn't carry over to life. Mm. I never understood that having club practice during the high school season, because you're right. What are they gaining from that? What's, is anyone doing a cost benefit analysis here? And another thing is a lot of these soccer clubs have GPS technology and cool guys. Like I, I use it as, as ammunition to show parents how much people are doing. And then parents are like, look at the data, we need a break. So that's good for that. But too Mm -hmm. often I see these club coaches, a not looking at the data or be there looking at the data, but they're not doing anything with it. Mm -hmm. They're just like, Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Workload has been sitting at an eight out of 10 for the past month. And yeah, that doesn't seem right, but you know, we're just going to keep going. 
And my question is then what's mm-hmm. the point of the GPS system if it's not solution-based, if you're not doing true load management and technology can be used for such good, but it also can be ruined by people who don't mm-hmm. know how to analyze the data. And that's a big problem in soccer right now. Mm-hmm. It's such a problem. And like, like you said, I just find those that don't know how to analyze the data are just using the word, like we have technology as like mm-hmm. a sales pitch, as though it sounds like I care about my athlete, uh, your athletes, but we actually don't know what this means or what we need to change. So we don't, but we have the data. <laughs> it's just like, cool. That sounds nice, but you don't do anything with it. All right. Why did you waste your money on the technology besides to use it as a selling point for me? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. And, you know, I've, I've heard that before that they get them for the selling point. And I've had coaches chime in on Twitter when I talk about this stuff and they're like, well, like it's competitive to get people to play for your club. And we want to show that we have all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, great. But you're kind of lying to people right off the bat, because then once they're in with you, with your team, you're not using it. So you're lying. I hate it. it's like where's your moral code like do we not have moral codes we're working with youth like I feel like Mm -hmm. that should be the paramount characteristic of any business any club any coach that you deal with it should have a moral code because if not why are you exposing your youth to them they're kids they're kids they're still developing we need to teach them these values of like Hey, it's nice to make money, but it's more important to make sure that you're healthy, strong, and well-rounded. That's what's most important. It is. And for, for the coaches listening, I mean, there's so many great resources on load management. And if you really take the time to learn it, or if you don't have time, outsource it to someone else please do so. And, and please inform your female athletes what this data means and how they can take actionable steps to use the data to stay healthy. That's why the technology is there in the first place. It's there to keep girls healthy. So for all you tech people, make sure you're actually making the most of it. (laughs) Absolutely. So I I do want to just wrap up. So we talked a lot about overuse and the year round grind. Do you have any just closing thoughts for people for just non-negotiable things we all need to be doing for just staying healthy year round. I mean, we've talked about strength training before and our best athletes strength train year round and stay the healthiest, but is there anything else we need to be focusing on? Oh, sleep and nutrition, right? I feel like those are the three pillars of just, well, really four when it comes to just I, mental uh, work as well, but sleep, if your athlete's not sleeping eight hours a night, why are you letting her work? Like do all of these things. She needs it not just for like her sport, but her brain isn't done developing. (laughs) She needs sleep. That's where that growth occurs from a mental, from her brain, actual standpoint, nutrition. Does she know what a protein carbon fat are? Does she understand what they do for her body? Because these are the fundamentals of nutrition. A lot of times we find issues where parents are like, well, I want my daughter to learn how to gain muscle. I want my daughter to lose weight where it's like, okay, great. We're going to focus on the fundamentals because I can't teach anything until the fundamentals are understood. That's like saying you want to learn calculus, but you don't know how to add. Let's understand the addition and subtraction before we go crazy, because oftentimes you can reach your goals by the fundamentals. Obviously, like we said, strength and conditioning training year round. And then that last part is checking in on your athlete, that mental stress, how is she feeling? And that's going to coincide with how much rest is she getting from her sport? Are we burning the candle at both ends? Take a look at her schedule. I urge parents to sit down and actually calculate how many hours per week is my daughter actually doing in sport? How does that look over the course of months? Is she not getting a month that she's less than 10 hours? That's a problem. And that's something that that's like a low hanging fruit. We can focus on on them. Pick a summer month, pick, give me at least two months where your athlete isn't engaged in some type of competitive play. And all she's doing is focusing on her body in terms of being strong and healthy. And she's having fun. 
Because if we focus on those four main areas, we're going to lead these girls not only to success now, but to success in the future. And that's what we want for these girls, long-term success. That was such a a good closing summary there, Emily. And I want everyone to just follow up with you. So in the caption below, guys, please check out Emily's Instagram as well as Twitter and also her website. And I'm sure Emily will be back on in the future. I mean, we have so much to talk about and she's like my twin because we work with the exact same population and it's just (laughs) It's just nice to to just go back and forth and try and solve these problems that are happening happening in youth female sports and performance. So Emily, thank you again for coming on and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you. Bye guys.